meteorite is a very interesting and extremely beautiful material. I mean, just, just look at it. And the coolest thing is, is that this structure cannot form on Earth. It requires millions and millions of years of extremely slow cooling. So unless you have a lot of time on your hands, you're not making it. But I have a little bit of time and I want to try. So the first thing we must do if we want to go on this journey of trying to make the meteorite structure is learn what this structure is actually called. It's called Wiedmannstatten. But how do Wiedmannstatten appear? Why do meteorites have this beautiful pattern? Well, it all starts at the inception of a meteorite. Let's say we have a major celestial impact. And with that impact, chunks of iron and nickel from the core of the celestial bodies are ejected into space. Now, these chunks of iron and nickel are initially really high energy, so they're going to be molten. But given a few million years, they will begin to cool. And as they cool, the iron and nickel will form a high temperature stable phase called taenite. At high temperatures, taenite exists over a huge range of iron and nickel compositions. So basically, the entire body of metal is going to be made out of taenite. But as the temperature decreases, that range of iron and nickel at which taenite can exist starts to decrease. And as the metal cools some more, we begin to see the precipitation of a new phase. Now this phase is more stable at lower temperatures, and it's called camasite. As the temperature decreases more, camasite becomes more and more stable. So we get more and more camasite. Now because this metal is cooling so slow at about one degree C per million years, as the taenite transforms into camasite, the camasite can grow in preferential directions. In a crystal lattice, there's always going to be some directions that are slightly easier for a crystal to grow in than other directions. Because of this, you get that fantastic parallel line effect that you see in Wiedmannstein. Those parallel lines are the taenite that have transformed into camasite. Now, I don't have a few hundred million years. So if I want to do this, how could I do it? Enter Al2Cu. This intermetallic compound forms massive rod-shaped intermetallic crystals, as you can see in this picture. So if I were to pour a molten aluminum copper alloy into a mold, here's what the solidification may look like. I'll get these rods of Al2Cu intermetallic propagating throughout the ingot. Between these intermetallic crystals, we should get a eutectic structure, which is a dual phase structure of copper phases and aluminum phases. This eutectic structure will be analogous to the taenite background on meteorites, and the intermetallic crystals will be analogous to the camasite phase that we see. However, this has none of the symmetry that we see in Wiedmannstatten. So I'm hoping if I can cool the alloy slow enough, I can allow some sort of directional solidification and see some sort of symmetry, similar to what this graphic is representing here. So speaking of alloys, how am I going to determine the composition of this alloy to get the ideal structure that I'm looking for? Well, let's take a look at this phase diagram here. The Al2Cu intermetallic compound is known as theta aluminum. That's what we're looking for. We can see that the theta aluminum occurs at roughly the 53% copper mark. This means that my entire material is going to be all theta aluminum. However, I don't want this. While I will have a lot of intermetallic crystals, I'll have no background to show them off. So I'm gonna to wanna to move slightly to the left on this diagram into the region of theta aluminum and alpha aluminum when the two phases exist together. So I'm gonna pick a point right here at about 45% copper. Here I'm close enough to the theta aluminum line that I expect to see many intermetallic crystals, but not all intermetallic crystals, so I have some sort of background to contrast them. So now I know the alloy I need to achieve the structure I'm looking for. 45% copper, 55% aluminum. Unfortunately, I need to buy copper. So $50 later, I was the proud owner of some refrigeration tube. Help offset these costs by buying one of these wonderful Lichtenbergs in the background here. They make wonderful lamps to illuminate your workstation while you weigh out the components necessary for the alloy you designed that was made to mimic Wiedmannstatten and meteorites. This, of course, among other things. Anyways, let's get this metal in the furnace. First, I'm gonna add the aluminum. Once it's molten, I'm gonna add the copper. The copper dissolves in the molten aluminum, so it's much easier to add it at this step than in the beginning. Once the crucible was preheated, we are ready to pour. 
Remember, when I pour this, I'm looking for those big intermetallic crystals. So I was so happy to see this. Look at all these intermetallic crystals. Just incredibly beautiful already. But that's not the goal right now. So here I'm going to pour a second ingot into a mold that has not been preheated to see if I can get a different sort of structure on the outside of the ingot due to the cold walls. Now on the outside, it looks pretty much the same. We have these huge intermetallic crystals, but what I'm interested in are those walls. So I still need that slow cooled ingot to try to get that directional solidification. And so here I'm going to take an ingot that I already casted, put it back into the furnace, melt it inside the mold, and allow it to cool over a period of eight hours. Eight hours later, we have our slow cooled solidified ingot. So this ingot looks cool on the top, but it's what's on the inside that counts. So let's start sanding and polishing these ingots to look at what's inside on the interior. And as you can see, these ingots look very different. We have the fast cooled in the chilled mold on the left with a very fine and porous structure. We have the preheated mold in the middle, which has a more coarse structure. And the obvious winner here, the slow cooled on the far right with extreme detail and really cool features. Here's a closer look at the ingot from the chilled mold, the ingot from the heated mold, and the ingot that was cooled over the course of eight hours. You can see there's a huge difference. Now, while this does look cool, it's obviously not Wittmannstatten. So we got some work to do in adjusting the alloy. If I take a look at just the inner metallic portion of this ingot, we see that there's a lot, a lot more than I would like. I would like less intermetallic and more background. And hopefully that would also be conducive for more of those intermetallic rods to show up rather than those star-shaped dendrites. So back to the phase diagram we go. If I want less intermetallic, that means I want less theta phase. So I'm gonna wanna move more to the left on the diagram than I was before. So let's move 5% to the left and try 40% copper in the new alloy. Also, let's try plus 5% copper. So 50% copper, just to see what would happen. So here are all those ingots casted at air temperature, not slow cooled. We have the 40% copper on the left, the 45% copper in the middle, and the 50% copper on the right here. We can tell if we're going for macro scale crystals on the surface, 45% is definitely the way to go. So let's follow the same process and slow cool them over eight hours. We have the 40%, the 45% in the middle, which was already polished, and then the 50% all the way on the right here. So let's get to sanding these down and see if we see anything interesting. And oh boy, do I see something interesting already. Look at that on the 40% copper. If you really convince yourself, you can see that there may be that crisscross pattern of Riemannstatten right in the corner here. So I'll keep the anticipation high for now. Here's the 50% polish, basically pure inner metallic, pretty ugly. Here's the 45% that we polished earlier. We know that looks pretty cool, not what we're looking for though. And then finally, the 40%. We're going to throw away that 50% because it's not interesting at all. Now, while both of these ingots have a really beautiful structure, that 45% copper is just not what we're looking for. And we're going to take a closer look at that 40% copper. You can see that we have far less random orientations of those inner metallic crystals. We also have the far more significant background structure, that eutectic material. And then look at this. That looks awfully close to Wiedmannstein. Of course, this is not Wiedmannstein, but it is beautifully inspired by it. We have that great symmetry that we see in Wiedmannstein, as well as a prominent contrast between two different phases. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to call it a win for this project. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, you can support us by purchasing one of our radiation-induced Lichtenberg figures in acrylic. These are made by initiating dielectric breakdown in acrylic via beta radiation from a particle accelerator.